Hello, everyone. I'm Brandon Clifford, the director of the Master of Architecture program, and welcome back to the lecture series. MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. So thank you all for joining us this evening. To those of you in the virtual cosmos, we are very happy to know that our community is here with us. Uh, please feel free to post your questions online because they'll be transcribed here. Um, and for those of you here physically, as you entered Long Lounge, you were given an index card. As you think of questions, please jot them down because they're gonna be collected towards the end of the presentation as a way to fuel the conversation that will follow. Tonight's lecture builds upon our ongoing research studio series. This particular studio titled Making Ingredients is being taught by our very own Lavender Tesmer and Diego Pinochet who will be joining us to help guide that conversation. In addition to our faculty, we've been inviting esteemed guests, critics, interlocutors, collaborators from outside of MIT to engage in this complex act of bridging between how we think and how we make. For posterity, I'm gonna note that this semester is MIT's return to campus. After a year and a half of virtual learning, uh, so we're talking about going full scale, on site, and engaging problematics of fabrication and site interventions. And we are very fortunate to be able to tap into the knowledge and experience of our guests of honor this evening, Maya Hayuk and Joseph Choma. Maya Hayuk paints the world in massively scaled, site-specific, vibrant, fresh, contemporary technicolor patterns that hold poignant resonance with ancient practices of weaving and cultural identity. Maya is a Ukrainian-American artist whose work is instantly recognizable, challenging the norms of narrative work that are seen in the onslaught of today's outdoor murals. Hayuk's work has been shown at venues such as the Albert Knox Museum in Frack, Museum Dunkirk, the Ukrainian Museum, the Bowery Wall in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Canadian Art, as well as the infamous Windwood Walls in Miami. Chances are you've come across Maya's work, and if the attribution did not land, you're gonna see it tonight, and we're gonna hear one of those memory ahs. Maya studied across the way at Massachusetts College of Art, as well as Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture, Virginia Commonwealth University, Ontario College of Art and Design, and the University of Odessa. Hayuk has received a number of fellowships, including the Clock Tower Residency with the Andy Warhol Foundation, the Lighthouse Works on Fisher Island in New York. In a school dedicated to the interdisciplinary practice surrounding the built environment, Maya, your contributions to the world are incredibly welcome here. We're also really excited to be joined this evening by an alumnus of the Department of Architecture, Joseph Choma. As an architect, author, and researcher, Joseph weaves amazing stories between worlds that struggle to overlap, between the purity of mathematics and the messiness of materials. Joseph is the founder of the Design Topology Lab and an associate professor of architecture at Clemson University, where he directs the Master of Science in Architecture program. He's a prolific author of three books, Morphing, A Guide to Mathematical Transformations for Architects and Designers, Etudes for Architects, and one of my favorite books, The Philosophy of Dumbness, not only because I'm in it, but I love the title as well. 
Uh, and just a side note, if you have any interest in book design or publishing or graphics, uh, Joseph, I will attest, is an amazing mentor in that respect and uh, endless conversations to follow, not to volunteer you for that task, Joseph. But, uh, as a researcher, his interests lie at the intersection of mathematics, folding, structure, and materials. He's received numerous awards, uh, including the American Institute of Architects and uh, from places like the American Composites Manufacturing Association. I think the point I'd like to make here is Joseph has a way of bridging between different worlds simultaneously. And in my opinion, Joseph's work is akin to a unicorn. He manages to make incredibly difficult and rigorous research appear effortless. His work bridges this gap between the arts and sciences while managing to pull off exceptionally well both. Recently, he was selected for the 2019-2020 NCCR Digital Fabrication Researcher in Residence at ETH in Zurich. He completed graduate studies in design and computation here at MIT and is currently completing a PhD in architecture at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom, uh, where he is a Cambridge International Scholar. We are all really thrilled to have both of you here with us, and if you can, join me in welcoming Maya Hayuk and Joseph Choma. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, you know, about 10 years ago, I graduated from the SMARCS Design and Computation Program. And when I reflect on those years, they were truly transformative years uh, for me as an individual, as a design researcher, as someone who just seeks knowledge and likes to share it. And it's especially a real pleasure to be here tonight to also present in front of my old thesis advisor, George Steine, who's in the audience. So thank you for being here. and. Uh, so that said, the title of the talk is Constraints as Opportunities. And I think this gets to the essence of my work, both as an educator as well as a researcher. The way in which a problem is decomposed imposes fundamental constraints on the way in which people attempt to solve that problem. Rodney Brooks. So if I gave you a sheet of paper and I asked you to make a cube, you might cut six squares together and create a cube like this. Or you might cut out a cruciform shape and fold the edges to create a cube like this a cube with discrete sides and discrete edges. But if I gave you a ball of clay and I asked you to make a cube with your hands, you might compress it in multiple directions, yielding a cube like this, a cube with rounded corners. So depending on which tool or medium is utilized will influence a set of possible results. This also relates to an idea called instrumentation, where a tool or instrument is used to record. A common example of that is photography. However, the way in which we choose to record something can transform the way we understand it. So for example, in this photograph by Andreas Feininger, we may think we know what a helicopter moving in space looks like, but when it's recorded this way, it's no longer just a photograph. To me, it becomes a drawing. It's a wireframe drawing, where I start to perceive a tube of space. And I'm particularly interested in the wireframe drawing as an abstraction, because it allows us to perceive the inside and the outside simultaneously. This also relates to ideas of constraints. And again, sometimes some individuals will literally make an emulation of a famous painting, like Mona Lisa, and will use the same technique to record it. But in this case, this individual is adding additional rules or constraints to that process. So here, using one continuous line with a brush pen, and changing the pressure of that brush pen, we're able to change the line weight. And this is an example of how constraints can yield new opportunities that we didn't see before. And that gets to the essence, again, of a lot of the work you'll see. There are two kinds of scientific revolutions, those driven by new concepts and those driven by new tools. In the last 500 years, we have had five major concept-driven revolutions. During the same period, there have been about 20 tool-driven revolutions. Freeman Dyson. Now, I don't know about you, but 
for me, when I walk around in a studio or I'm engaging with my students, the idea of something being tool-driven or concept-driven is more blurred than distinct. If they have an idea or a hypothesis that they say in science, what do they do? They test it. They make models. They make drawings to evaluate it and critique it. And if they don't know what to do, what do they do? They do something, right? It could be writing an algorithm. It could be making a model. It doesn't matter what it is. But, the, but we have faith in the process that eventually we'll generate ideas through that process, or at least create our own evaluation criteria. So again, for me, that's more blurred than distinct. That said, when Freeman Dyson writes about this, he describes an astronomer named James Bradley. Bradley had several important tool-driven contributions to the field of astronomy. But one in particular I'd like to point out is a collaboration with George Graham, who was an instrument maker. And the two of them together were the first to really calibrate telescopes. And they calibrated it to six figures of accuracy. And this is in the 1700s. And this is the first time any instrument had been calibrated to that level of precision. So for me, ideas of calibration get to the heart of rigor within the discourse of architecture and design research. So like I had mentioned, depending on which tool we use will influence a set of possible results. Sometimes when we're working within the digital world, in particular with software, we end up clicking buttons, but we don't really know what's under that button. We just, have, we just assume it's OK. And early on, I became interested in demystifying those buttons as a black box and try to understand them as a transparent tool. And this led to a fascination and interest in mathematics, where as I changed the equation, I changed the shape. And if I can understand the equation, it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. And so I'm going to give you one example of how I, use, I do something what I call sketching with mathematics. I call it sketching because, for me, sketching is different than just drawing. Drawing usually relates to a certain level of precision in the way in which something is recorded. While sketching, to me, is a little bit more like doodling in that the, in, within the imprecision of making those marks, we're searching for ideas. And so like the way Stan Allen might talk about the diagram as that which is between theory and practice, I like to think of sketching as that which is between dream and reality. So although I'll show you something done with extreme precision with math, again, I look at it as a search for ideas rather than in its, in its actual precision. So here's a torus or a donut. Uh, we have x, y, z, which is our Cartesian grid in space. And then u and v is the parameters of that shape. And at first, you know, the sine and cosine, which is in there, you may be familiar with, with it or you may not. Um, but really, this is very simple. If I, just, if I start to break it down, if you see cosine v and sine v, that's just a circle. And then we go again, there's sine u, cosine u, that's just another circle. And then another sine u, cosine u, that's just another circle. So really, the donut or the torus is just the interpolation of three circles in space. And once you understand that, you can start doing a lot. And that one and a half that's in front, that's just controlling the radius of that geometry. So here's just a simple example of taking this shape that's known in the dictionary and transforming it into something that's been designed. In this case, a pavilion or an inhabitable sculpture. So I apply texturing, apply twisting, and then I apply flattening. And then after that, I simply do cutting. And you can think of this as an elevation for a pavilion, where there's a point of entry, as well as it being anchored to one side and a certain level of dynamism. And I could just stop here, or maybe I want to continue that process, and maybe I don't want to make it a double twist. Now we get into other aesthetic ideas that I'm interested in, ideas of duality or contested symmetries, where two halves are fighting with one another for hierarchy. So again, moving from something purely technical into ideas and concepts that we can evaluate. Here's looking up that single twist. Here's looking up that double twist. Again, the single twist. And again, the double twist. And when I look at this image, I also there's another aesthetic idea that I'm also interested in, which is those ripples on the surface. Because they become singularities for our eye to trace. Suddenly our eye are tracing these curves in 3D space. And I could just stop here enter it in a competition, maybe try to get it built. Yeah, we can build this. We can use steel and cladding. There's lots of ways we can build this. But for me, just because we can build it with our current means and methods doesn't mean we should. When approximately 40% of the carbon dioxide emissions in the world are from the built environment, we have an ethical responsibility to not just design something, but design the way in which it's made. And so therefore, maybe through a process or a mind frame of not just thinking about instrumentation, how do I record something as precise as possible, 
we need to embrace other constraints and maybe go through a process of translation, allowing the design to change and evolve with different constraints such as materials and structure. So maybe those ripples on the surface don't want to be ripples. Maybe they want to be curved creases. So why folding? Well, as soon as you fold the sheet of material, you gain structural depth. If you organize the folds appropriately, you can have flat packing capabilities, and you can have numerous variations with one systematic method. So numerous variations, flat packing capabilities, structural depth. That said, I'm not interested in origami, but I'm interested in folded structures. And I like to make a distinction here. Once a folded geometry has a specific orientation to gravity with the intent of carrying loads, with the intent of being built at a larger scale with actual materials with material thickness, the way in which we evaluate and critique it is a different framework than just origami. So I like to make that distinction. That said, in architecture, we think we have a whole discourse called folded structures. However, most folded structures are not folded at all, but are fold inspired. And what I mean by that is this is considered the world's first folded structure. That's drastically different than folding a sheet of paper. That's a precast concrete structure. I'm interested in literally folding materials at the scale of architecture. So how do we translate paper folding to materials which have the potential to scale up? And for that, the material I look at is fiber reinforced polymers, FRP, fiberglass carbon fiber. And although this material has been around for a while, it's only within recent years that the International Building Code has actually recognized it as a viable building material. It's also only within recent years that the American Composites Manufacturers Association has written the first guidelines and recommended practices for FRP architectural products. This is not to say that this is the material of the future, but it does suggest that it's going to be more widely used in architecture. So if it's going to be more widely used in architecture, what is the future of FRP for architectural applications? So this is the San Francisco MoMA expansion, designed by Snohetta, fabricated by Chrysler Associates. It's the largest implementation of FRP construction in the United States, major advancements in fireproofing technology. However, it's made of 710 unique parts that were made with 710 unique molds. Yes, we can do this. We live in a mass customized world. But when a well-made mold can be used over a thousand times, I can't see this as the future for fabrication for FRP. On the other hand, here's an example by David Reby of Windsor Fiberglass, where he's only designing one mold, but he's designing it such that all the edge conditions are exactly the same. So as you rotate, rotate this facade system, you get the optical illusion of variation. I think this is a future. This reminds me of Joseph Albers' minimum means, maximum effect, or economy of design, where again, constraints are leading to new opportunities. However, this application is only limited to, again, cladding applications, and I'm interested in structural possibilities as well. And then we have things like this, like this reconfigurable mold by Adapa, adaptable mold. This is a great technology that allows for numerous variations. It's used a lot in the aircraft industry as well as automotive industry. However, it's not a machine I can just buy and stick in my garage. It's not a technology that's accessible to everyone. And I'm particularly interested in how we can make techniques and technologies accessible to a wider audience. And then we have no mold as another vision. And so this is work done in Stuttgart using robotic arms and drones to weave carbon fiber and fiberglass together to create structures like this. I also think this is a future. However, it's not a future for all applications. For example, if you needed to make a deployable shelter for disaster relief, this is not the right application. That said, this also relies heavily on robotic arms and drones. And a lot of times when we think about the future of building, we focus on this cloud of high tech. And I wonder when we're focusing on this cloud of high tech possibilities, if sometimes we're missing low tech possibilities as well. So that said, this is my technique.
So you take a dry fiber reinforcement fabric, you apply a mask, paint on resin, remove the mask, and you have flexible hinges or a foldable composite. It's simple. It's so simple that many may think it's trivial, except for the fact that no one had ever done it before. Why did no one ever do it before? Well, because when given fiberglass, the thought is we need a mold. So in order to see new possibilities, sometimes we have to remember to forget. That said, it's completely low tech, and I'm actually really proud that it's low tech because it makes the technology accessible to everyone. But that doesn't mean that it can't be fully automated. So for example, with inkjet printing technology, we can think about it as a zone A and a zone B and do a selective coding process. And I'm particularly interested in getting this duality between the high tech and low tech, or something that we've done as we spoke element with one individual versus something that's in a manufacturing setting. So now I'm gonna show you how I've started to scale this up. So first, I'm gonna show you an arch. Here's a crease pattern out of fiberglass. It's approximately 33 feet by 22 feet, possibly one of the world's largest crease patterns. But the entire crease pattern flat packs to a width of just about 12 inches, which meant that four individuals could easily carry it to the site. And then when deployed, it looks like this. So we're spanning 16 feet with a material thickness that's just 1 16th of an inch. So after doing that, then the next question was, what are the constraints and limitations of translating paper folding into foldable composites? Is it possible that everything I fold out of paper can be folded with fiberglass? So to try to answer this question, I actually ask another question, which is, is it possible to fold fiberglass along curved creases? Since curved creases are the hardest to fold with paper, let's see if we can fold them with fiberglass. So I look at a saddle geometry. And I go back to history, looking at student work of Joseph Albers at the Bauhaus, where they take a series of concentric circles alternating between mountain and valleys as a means to create that geometry. And when you fold that crease pattern and you orient it towards gravity, this is how it looks. However, if I take it and I increase it from eight concentric circles to 20, they get a totally different degree of freedom. Now within this photograph, my hand is not a trivial aspect of that image. It is precisely my hand that is allowing for an asymmetrical relationship with that, with that piece of model. And I started to think, well, maybe with resin and fiberglass, we can freeze this in any particular position in space. So we take an eight foot in diameter fiberglass disc and we fold it. To fold that paper model with 20 concentric rings took at least two hours, and it was a real pain. To fold the eight foot in diameter fiberglass disc, it took us three minutes. And that was the first time we had ever done it. It wasn't rehearsed, it wasn't practiced. Why was it so much easier? Because the material actually became programmed, but there were zones that were meant to be rigid and zones meant to be flexible. And so it inherently knew it wanted to fold. And in particular, when people scale up paper folding, one of the things sometimes that's forgotten is you also have to scale up those hinges. So calibrating the width of those hinges is non-trivial in relationship to material thickness. So this is what it looks like. And in particular, when I look at this image here, and I think back to that torus I showed you earlier on, this has some of the same ideas. There's this idea of a duality or contested symmetry. There's singularities or curves that our eye can tra trace in three-dimensional space. And so maybe that torus didn't want to be a torus at all. Maybe it just wanted to be 20 concentric circles. That said, you may think of this as just as an object. And you may say, well, what's the practical applications of this? So what are the potential architectural applications of this technique or technology? And for that, I begin with a ceiling or a wall. Here is a crease pattern that was inspired by the work of David Huffman. It's a series of mountain and valley folds. However, when I look at this as someone who's trained as an architect, I don't just see a crease pattern. 
I see a reflected ceiling plan. For me, those diamonds in space look like locations of columns in space. And so this is what it looks like as a crease pattern. Here it's folded out of paper. And here it's folded out of one continuous sheet of fiberglass, and this is eight feet long. And originally when I imagined this, again as a ceiling, I saw it as a stay-in-place formwork for a concrete slab where we'd get the tensile reinforcement on the underside of the slab where it's needed most. So in each of these nodes become locations for columns to receive it in space. However, here at eight feet long, it has a structural depth of approximately one foot, so it's able to be a freestanding wall partition. And here's a detail of one of those nodes. Then I look at a column. So here's a column folded out of paper. It's approximately eight inches tall. And here's a column folded out of fiberglass that's eight feet tall. And although I started out by critiquing the idea of a mold, after making this, I started thinking, wow, wouldn't that be a great formwork, a stay-in-place formwork for a concrete column where we get extra tensile reinforcement? Or wouldn't it be a great reusable formwork for concrete? And so that led me to look at concrete. And in particular, how can folding advance concrete casting? And just to kind of lay a spectrum for concrete casting, on one hand, when you look at prefabricated elements, you have these very heavy duty formworks like these. And these can be used many times over and over, but they're difficult to move, so again, it requires the being off site. And again, they're only producing the exact same part over and over again. So there's not an, an ability to have bespoke custom elements within this framework. And then when you do go to custom formworks like these, we get something that takes up a very, very large portion of the construction budget. They're all used only once, and then they're discarded to a landfill. So between this extreme of very heavy duty formworks that are used over and over again, versus ones that are completely custom and then basically discarded in a landfill, there's a lot of room for improvement in formwork. And so we decided to look at ultra thin formworks that can be recycled. And this is done in collaboration with researchers at the ETH in Zurich. In particular, myself and Anna Lorette Fritzi are the principal investigators of this research. They bring an expertise in digital casting as well as the chemistry of concrete, in particular looking at set-on-demand casting as a method. And I bring with me my expertise in crease engineering and, the, and understanding the geometry of how formers can be designed. So the first problem they gave me was, how do I design a stronger hinge? And when you think about a hinge, it opens and closes, but it's never fixed at any particular angle, so it's unstable. Well, if I take that same principle and I apply curved creases to it that kiss, depending on how you calibrate the arc of that curved crease, at some point, that fold will lock in place and won't fold anymore. And what's essentially happening is controlled buckling. Sometimes you think about buckling as being something bad, but if buckling is happening inward, it can resist the hydrostatic pressure of the concrete pushing outward. And this became the basic principle for how to design strong formwork. So here's a detail of one of those formwork. And as far as for the material of it, it's just paper. It's paper that's wax coated on one side, and this is only a half a millimeter thick, and this is one meter tall. So we cast in it. And when you look closely at this detail, you can see that it's resisting the hydrostatic pressure of the concrete. And then for me, the real beauty of it is, it peels off like a candy wrapper. So you could potentially ship it to site with the paper intact, maintaining the highest quality surface finish, and then when you peel it off, again, there it is. Currently, we've had success casting as high as three meters tall, but we're still in the process of calibrating the concrete mixture to match exactly construction standards, as well as the paper thickness and geometry tolerance. But it looks very promising. So I, in my opinion, folding can transform the way we design and build. However, that said, I think this is just one of many exciting features for the way we can build in the built environment. Thank you very much. Okay. Wow. Thank you. That was really cool. Um, this is really cool. I. Uh, wasn't sure if I was going to share this with you guys, but the, uh, when I was going to Mass Art, the only time I visited MIT 
while I was living in Cambridge was to come see Nirvana play in the basement of a frat house. So that was my entire MIT experience <laughs> prior to this new incredible journey I'm on. And uh, anyway, just honored, Ooh, just honored and very grateful. All right, so let's see how I can make this happen. All right. Um, so I am also, uh, one thing we have in common, Joseph, I'm, um, and a lot of us do, is um, we're all, I seem to be extremely fascinated with how my mistakes and how my experiments and how my failures uh, become opportunities. And um, it's something that I thrive on and it's something that I actually seek. And uh, what I'd like to do tonight is take you through a series of questions that I pose when I'm um, thinking about doing a project rather than giving you all of the answers um, because I think about this constantly. So let's start like this. Um, so yeah, so I paint these all over the world. Um, I've been um, at it for a while, and um, I've learned quite a number of things. And um, when I start thinking about a project and uh, decide if, if I'm in a sort of state of mind of deciding whether or not I'm gonna do it, I ask myself a series of questions. And the first one is always, am I in love? Will I be in love? Am I completely gonna have the best experience doing this. And anything shy of that is usually just not worth it. Um, I start thinking about you know, what I look for in, uh, in the buildings, in the sites. I look at vantage points. I look at light. I look at um, what the community is. I look at the history of the space. Um, there's a huge list right there. Um, but I want to share with you this image, which is uh, crew of artists I used to paint with called the Barnstormers, and um, they basically painted barns down in North Carolina and um, all over the world. And this is a speaker system that, ha that has a motherboard that is attached to like every single one of those speakers individually. It was epic. We worked together and we learned how to collaborate together. And you know, there were tears and there were fights and stuff, but um, the most valuable thing I learned from that experience was how to actually collaborate and what that means. And I turned that idea inward into like, what does it mean to collaborate with myself in my studio? And that's what it looks like to collaborate with myself in my studio. <laughs> so the way that I generally like to start and, um, and the thing that makes the most sense because I'm improvising everything and because I want everything to be an experiment and because I want it to be a drawing that's happening for the first time, I usually make some kind of scribble, go a little bonkers and just see where it goes. This was um, some time ago and I have a number of these kind of paintings that are just, um, I'm gonna say bonkers. Um, I often put constraints upon myself. Um, this was at the Hammer Museum, and uh, one of the sections of the wall in the show I was in, uh, I decided I was gonna paint this wall in eight hours, and that was the constraint I gave to myself, and that was my result. 
Um, I, I discovered something uh, kind of personal about myself when I uh, was painting all over the place, but I was resisting working with assistants because I couldn't express to an, as an assistant, you know, like what to do because I'm making it up as I go along. And I also believe that my ego is a little bit tied into that, that I really like wanted to prove myself and I needed to be as good as, if not better than my male counterparts, to be honest. So this is a example of one of those kind of paintings and like you can see me down there next to the one way sign um, to give you a sense of scale. Um, this was the big game changer painting in my career. Um, it's the Bowery Wall, if any of you are familiar with it. It's on the corner of Houston and Bowery in New York. And um, historically, it, um, everybody from Keith Haring to Barry McGee to everyone <laughs> has painted this wall. And I was invited, but um, what I had to work through to make this painting happen was uh, the polar vortex is what they called it. So we could only get in about like four hours of painting a day. The paint was freezing. We had to figure out ways to like boil water to get rid of the icicles and stuff. Um, and, sorry. <laughs> and, um, and when I talk about uh, constraints and I talk about um, collaboration and collaborating with myself, there are all these other var variables that are like completely outside of con my control. And um, one of those is something that I call uh, forced collaboration. And that is a collaboration against your will. In this case, I came to work one morning and there was a line of graffiti across the wall. And, uh, rather than repainting it, I decided to sort of use like a razzle-dazzle warship technique of obscuring the graffiti and also letting them know that I won. I don't know, I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna egg anyone on. And that, that painting became um, quite iconic, quite uh, beloved and um, it also set forth a series of these paintings where I was working with these kind of, these patterns that were traditionally made by women, usually anonymously, and um, as coded messages and um, embroidery that would be given as a gift to someone's for someone's birth or their marriage, um, and uh, I everything started scaling up and up. And uh, here's an example of um, a a situation at the Hammer Museum where I was unable to have a traditional lift in this space, so I was climbing these monkey bars, basically, of a scaffolding, um, and that was the result there. Um, so when I talk about improvising and I talk about uh, drawing things for the first time, one of the, one of the first things I do is usually kind of like map something out, but I, I resist using as many tools as possible. I find machines always break. I find that tools get lost um, and there's something less human and I really want to be able to have that connection between my self and the actual wall. So this is in Dunkirk in France and this is how the painting developed. Um, the weather uh, was something we had to contend with. The wind would whip in like two different directions at the same time. Um, we, uh, yeah, we had to get around some like pretty unpredictable. Uh, w uh, <laughs> All right, we the pretty much the funniest thing that we had to deal with was a couple of, um, how, how would you deal with, like a couple of the local neighbors coming by and in French letting us know how terrible the painting was. Like it was purely awful and we need to fix it and we need to fix the paint drips and it's just not right. And um, so I, we've been always learning about these different levels of like diplomacy as, <laughs> as we work. Um, this is the extent of a sketch that I might make, um, just sort of plotting out space and place, I think. Yeah, this is um, the view from the lift. Uh, 
And I'm jumping around in time here a little bit to sort of give you uh, this narrative that um, this is, you know, as it's completed. Um, what I like about this painting so much is that you see the humanity in it and you see what was there before and you see that it's not perfect. If you wanted perfect, you can use any kind of tool to uh, make that happen. Um, so I want to give you an example of the opposite of that, which was in Charleroi in Belgium. And I don't know if you can see from the stripes, but I, I painted all those stripes based on the seams of the existing um, concrete. And so they were just a little wavy, but like not crazy off the wall. They were, but you know, they were a little wavy. And my assistants um, were, uh, really adamant about those lines being straight. And um, it's the one and only time I actually succumbed to their wishes where um, I went ahead and let them straighten the, the lines out. And what I'm looking at is basically like what the Photoshop of the paint colors that we had to mix. I, I can't tell it apart from and um, it's massive, it's amazing, it's beautiful, but there's something about it that lacks humanity for me. And um, I learned quite a bit from that. Um, you rule. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is a good example of what my sketches look like on, on a wall. And this is uh, a means of getting around not having another lift. Um, you make one out of a bunch of roller extension poles and you make it happen. Um, this is what the original sort of sketch-ish idea was for this wall that um, because we had so many constraints due to time, due to broken machinery, due to an assistant who was afraid of heights, on a 14-story building, we had to keep, I had to keep editing and editing and editing until I completed the piece, um, which is quite far from what the original intention was. And, um, and that intention never would have been like spot on, but it kind of was like in that realm. Um, and this is in Berlin, which is another example of how I uh, question whether making something really complicated on a wall is uh, more impactful than scaling something from a detail of something else up really large. Um, in Sweden, the same thing. In Copenhagen. Uh, this was in the Facebook office in Menlo Park that Frank Gehry and Partners designed, and I was um, invited to paint the lobby, which was quite an honor. And one of the things that Frank Gehry uh, I'm not sure how much you guys know about this particular building, but he had an objective to keep all of the air ducts and all the beams and all of the um, things that would normally be hidden behind uh, drywall and stuff visible. So my entire design was based off of the same um, slopes and stuff of the, you know, the beams that X matched the beams right next to it. And I, um, because there was no baseboard, I was able to let the paint drop all the way down to the ground, and that whole area is covered in these like pools of multicolored paint. And I also made sure to get rid of all the paint. I didn't want to walk out with any gallons, so I painted around the whole lobby. And each one of those lines that you see on the right is like how when until the paint ran out, and a view from the night. Um, so this is in, uh, in the MIMA Museum in Brussels. Um, this was a museum opening up in what used to be a beer brewery, and the top floor is shaped like a vessel because it would contain grain, and that grain needed to dry out, and there was a roof that had uh, opening in it that would come in, um, you know, they'd pour the grain in from the canal right next door, and um, I was asked to paint this space. Um, and we learned really quickly, like we couldn't get a scissor lift in there. We couldn't get uh, much other than like some, these, some of these ladders and a scaffold. And uh, this idea of being like a pretty heavy physical endurance kind of ensued. So this is the space as it uh, 
was being made, and this is uh, how it looked when we were through. And um, the day before the show opened, um, the terrorist attacks happened in Brussels. So this space, uh, the entire intention of the space and the entire um, heart of it became something else that um, carried on as a kind of place for peace and contemplation and good, good vibes. Uh, this is in uh, Mongolia, in Ulaanbaatar, and uh, this is like contending with snow and sleet, and um, a good question is being asked to John whether or not this is sleet or slow. We're on a quarry that has been filled with water, and um, we don't know whether the paint will even stick to the wall. We, um, we don't really have ladders that work. We have like some pieces of wood that are sort of like nailed together. Um, this is a view from above, and this is the painting complete. Um, one of the things I've learned through these experiences, especially traveling to places like Ulaanbaatar, like Morocco, um, and, uh, and even in certain places in Europe, is that I carry my own tools, I minimize the amount of tools that I bring, and I know that there are so many variables that are going to mess me up or trip me up that um, I try to keep it as simple as possible. So. Um, this was in Rabat, uh, Morocco, in 2015. The wall turned into that, and they invited me back. And of course, I didn't want to repaint the same mural, but I did want to work on um, a, the kind of language that I had been working on in my studio. And I found it to be kind of challenging to also employ two assistants. And I did something that I had vowed I would never do. <laughs> And that is, um, I actually sketched out on a wall. And, and um, for someone who's so adamant about not sketching, um, it was like this like big new moment for me. And I'm especially psyched about this use of palm tree um, as a means of getting the job done. So the painting grew. And uh, the painting was complete. And then um, the painting you saw in Heerlen in the Netherlands, uh, that was uh, the most recent painting I just did. But this is, um, uh, I guess, about a few weeks just prior to that. And this was um, a part of Albert Knox Museum, the, uh, a building that was uh, designed by Mike Tunkey um, at Canon. And um, the challenge I had with this particular project was that um, this cement was a kind of mineral, what is it called? Non-pigmented fiber cement minaret board. And it required this mineral paint that um, had to bind with that, uh, with that actual substrate. I had no no uh, ability to use like fluorescence and I had to really plot things out. And when the paint arrived, um, there was a miscommunication in the order and I only had transparent paints to work with. Um, so I was set up for like a really tough challenge to figure out how to work with only transparents when so much of my work is based on the play of, of um, transparency and op opacity. And uh, this is how it came out. There's me down in the middle bottom, kind of gives you an idea of like what, uh, how it came out. But I, um, I kind of want to end it on just like letting you guys uh, have a, the basic idea of the constraints that, the, that I deal with the most. Time is always the number one thing that will mess everything up. Um, Earthquakes have happened, like while we're painting. Uh, machines will always break. Um, there's always the sad truth of uh, poor organization and poor pre-production um, that, you know, or lack of support. There's injury. Uh, 
from dancing because I wanted to dance like that Justin Bieber video and messed up my knee and still went to France and still went to Mongolia on a knee that wouldn't bend. I, I, I take responsibility for that one. Um, but there's fatigue, there's hangovers, there, there are holidays, there are worker strikes, there are, um, there are so many things that are outside of our control while we're working, but um, I, you know, I look towards these projects and I have to weigh out whether they're actually viable and the goal is usually to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, and I take great pride in that, but uh, yeah, I mean, basically I'm working on and I'm working towards uh, further collaborations such as these. Um, these collaborations are not only with the wall, but with the community there. Um, I wonder about like what it is I'm leaving behind. Um, I'm looking forward to the coming year where I hope to be working with a prison opening in Europe, in Northern Europe, where they have a bit of a different sense of um, incarceration um, and some other exhibitions and some other buildings that uh, each one is presenting themselves as being like a real challenge. So that's what's up. Um, I thank you. <laughs> that's what I got. And I wanted to end with this image um, that Joseph and I uh, collaborated on a piece last week in the time that we've met here. This was made with foam core and gaffer's tape. Um, it was cut on a CNC cutter with, from my downstairs neighbors. It was foam core, so it was absolutely the wrong material to use to have that flexibility that we needed. And I did add those bottom triangles, as you can see that he was telling you about, like that that was the thing that gave it the structure. So I figured we'd have a, like a nice background for our conversation from that. Anyway, thank you so much. I'm spazzed out. Okay. Hi. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Yeah, so since, uh, <laughs> since coming back to MIT, uh, I've had a real joy and pleasure in getting to know Maya and uh, been learning a lot from her. And yeah, since we've had a number of conversations, we thought maybe we might just start this with our own conversation. That's kind of an extension of what we've been talking about together. And in particular, a lot of times we find that we're using similar terms, but in slightly different contexts or very different contexts at times. Um, and maybe I was thinking we could start off by talking a little bit about, uh, we both have, have heard us both use the word collaborators mm. to sometimes refer to us collaborating not just with people, but with things that seem inanimate. Um, and, and sometimes for you, you talk about it with sight and other constraints. And I was wondering if maybe we could start with some of that. That is the best. That you're so awesome. I've learned so much from you so far. I want to be. I want to keep learning. <laughs> um, the the word collaboration um, is like one of those umbrella terms. I think that comes up all the time, and I feel like I've been able to start like putting it into like different kinds of groups, depending on who's using it and depending what um, their thinking behind it is. So when I get a email from a brand, a company that wants to collaborate with me, they're not talking about like the fun exchange of like hanging out and making work together as we did with the barnstormers or what we did with this. You know, they're talking about uh, a means of trying to use a word that will uh, incite me to like do something artistic for them. So I, 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 those. I shy away from those like very hard, and I uh, and I as soon as I see that word in certain emails, I'm like, deal breaker, done. You know, um, uh, 
I see you uh, collaborating with your students, and uh, you said something really cool today about how that that moment of putting those things together that took like three minutes was, um, I don't know if you said the word ritual, but, but it was like a celebration, you know? And like, you were just all in it and you're all in the same headspace and you just made this thing happen. So um, yeah, that's, that's like, that goes under this box of like awesome collaboration, I think, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I, for me, like there's, yeah, there's different types of collaboration, like, a, when I'm doing something that's more tool driven, it's not just about, okay, I'm, this tool is subservient to me, but it's about like whether it's math or a material, but it's also about listening to those tools mm -hmm. and saying, how can they, that, by listening to their constraints, how can that influence what I do and generate ideas and work within it? So I see that as a collaboration, but then also like what Maya was saying, like a, you know, if I do a big crease pattern with curved creases out of fiberglass, we did one the other day that's 16 feet long in my studio, and suddenly it was like, okay, we need five of you to do this. Let's get, you know, five of you, get up, let's do this. We start folding it. And, you know, and since they're curved creases, they're bi-stable, so they have to pop into place. So people are smacking their arm this way, smacking their arm this way. So they, whoop, it popped into place, and then we go, smack over here, whoop, popped into place. And a few minutes later, oh, there it is. And it's just, uh, but it's this amazing moment where it's the fact that it takes more people to actually pop it into place is kind of the beauty of it in some ways. It becomes like a performance. Yeah. Yeah, the fact that I can no longer want, like a piece of paper can be personal. That's my conversation with the paper, and, and I can be in my little corner, whatever, listening to jazz and whatever. But no, when it's suddenly at that scale, yeah, all, the, all these hands get involved, and it makes for a memory, and it's just a different kind of social act. Mm. And, and you have similar with the way you might start to have some idea. I love the way you talked about how you don't just plan out, like as architects, we sometimes plan out the whole thing, oh, and then we're gonna record it on the construction site, right? But you, you it's, it's no, no, it's this partially have an idea, part, and then a lot of it is it's kind of just this improvisation um, based on a lot of constraints with also an, an idea or agenda, and then all these people that help you. Yeah. Maybe you can talk a little more about some of that. Oh, yeah. Um, I've, um, I'm lucky that I have a really good team. It, it's taken me a long time to find, you know, the people who I like really vibe with because there, um, there's a lot of ego in everything. I'm shaped. your field. I'm sure there's a little ego, <laughs> um, and there certainly is amongst artists. So um, what I love about my team of, you know, I've John, Michael, Nick, Alethea, um, Paul. There's so many people who we just get along and we have a natural way of knowing how to support one another. And um, no one is a bully, no one's showing off, um, no one's trying to take the lead. It's like a, yeah, just like a decentralized uh, sort of like, po like political system, if you will. It's just not, it, we're in it together. I mean, it's under my name, of course, but, um, but everyone's like really quick on their feet, like thinking a few steps ahead of like how to get through these things that are about to happen. Like there's a storm coming, that, that lift is stuck in the mud. Um, when we were painting in Dallas, actually we had to cut out, it was last March because COVID um, shut the whole city down and we were still like, but we just gotta finish this painting, you know, and um, made it onto the airplane, made it home. Um, but I feel incredibly lucky because uh, for me, art had always been something that was just mine and it was my thing that I didn't have to share it with anyone. I just did it in my room with my headphones by myself. And I find it um, pretty incredible if artists and, and et, et cetera can like work together and figure out ways to, uh, to not only enjoy themselves, you know, but like the outcome will be as good as that, that really tight production and that really good understanding amongst friends, basically. So I'm glad you, you seem to have like a really good team. And you're always developing new teams, probably, too. That's right, yeah. It's just, uh, it's, it's kind of just a growing conversation. And, uh, and it's like, a, and as someone who teaches, you know, it's just a lot of fun to share things with people. And so, yeah. And, um, 
And also, one thing which I know when we've both talked about in the past, we've also sometimes referred to things as games. Yes. And uh, playing games, creating our own games. You talked about a little bit with uh, the project that you did for, for Facebook with Gary's yeah. building. And yeah. Um, maybe you could talk a little more about that. And also, I know you showed me at one time these kind of doodles of patterns that you're starting to work through. Maybe you can talk yeah. about some of that as well. Well, those are the one-liners. I call them one-liners because generally they are one line. And um, I made piles and piles of them during the lockdown um, along with a stack of Sudoku books. I don't know how tall the stack would be at this point. And uh, I, it, was, it was what would calm me down. And um, it was what would kind of like keep my, my mind just in a, like a nice, calm, peaceful space. But I, um, I generated so many of these, and I found myself uh, realizing that, like, even though I was avoiding this studio uh, during COVID, COVID, um, I was painting up on the roof, and I was sending, uh, making protest posters with my friend Snowman, and we were sending them down to protesters that were coming by. I just didn't find my studio to be a space I wanted to activate. It there was. It just didn't make sense. So, um, yeah, the one-liners um, are the things that I can now look back on, and if I ever like hit a uh, little bump in the road, there are things that I can look at. And um, what was the other thing you were saying? The uh, oh, the um, oh, like the the case of a game where oh, yeah. like you had the game of all right. Once the pain runs out. It's yeah, done. It's but done. until it runs out, I'm not done with this. Well, because also we didn't want to have to like carry the paint out. <laughs> like we, we wanted to throw it the cans away. Like we, what were we gonna do with the paint? Um, there's this really fun game that um, I like, uh, like collaborative drawing games, and hopefully we're gonna do this one tomorrow, where it's kind of like a game of telephone, where we draw from each other's drawings, and that drawing is passed on. When, and the original is no longer seen. And it's something that like my friends and I would do when we were just like hanging out as youngsters, because none of us were really affording uh, to go to bars or anything like that. So we sat around and drew, and we came up with all these games. And now they're like actual like teachable moments, you know, but it's, it's really quite cool. Um, I'm curious about the game that you are going to be presenting to us tomorrow. Yeah, and, and yeah. actually, does it, re does it involve computers? Well, and also, I think um, not just the game for tomorrow, but uh, when I first started teaching as a professor, I found that I was teaching too much. So for me, like the word to teach suggests to emulate. And actually, as a, if, if I can, I want to create a scenario where people can construct their own understanding of something. And so I started to as, a, as to learn that maybe I have to actually create pedagogical exercises or games or frameworks. Where when any individual goes into that framework or game, they learn something, a concept or an idea that's bigger than something technical. And you know, tomorrow I'll be kind of showing some examples of, or teach, I'll do some very simple examples with mathematics with the students uh, as a way of kind of showing how things that are really simple, like a circle, mm -hmm. can become really powerful as far as part to whole and constraints. And then it'll also be a, a kind of a ba basic demo into kind of folding and how just by yeah. looking at eight crease patterns, you can get a full spectrum of all different types of geometries and understand the constraints and bias of both something linear and how it works versus something curved. One which will have inherent buckling, you'll hear it popping. One which has flat packing capabilities. And so you'll understand the pros and cons of those two frameworks. So many times when I create games for students, it's to also just make constraints, make them aware of these constraints and bias that they may not see. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of, that becomes one of the big learning objectives for the way I approach games and teaching and, uh, and like any game, it should be fun. Like there should be just some certain moment of play. No, totally. Yeah, like um, I, I like the idea that in improv, like in the sense of like comedy school or acting, one of the techniques um, is to, to say yes to the proposition that you offer me. And, and you just move away from saying no, like in, in to keep the ball rolling, to keep the frisbee in the air, to keep the you know whatever the energy going, and um, and I can imagine that, uh, yeah, I can imagine that I have a lot to learn from what you're going to be bringing to the table tomorrow. Um, I'm I'm curious about, uh, yeah, I'm I'm curious about 
how, well, one, okay, I have to, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is, I am so in love with the folded stuff that reminds me of the Bauhaus that looked directly inspired by Joseph Albers. Like that work of yours is um, absolutely like what made me like, it's like what got me when I was watching your video prior to meeting you where I was like, oh man, that's so it. And, I, and, and listening to you talk, I was like, this is really weird. Like we have so many, there's so many crossovers, but um, we, we exist in slightly different worlds, and I, I hope that's not gonna stay true in in respect of like artists and architects and whatnot, engineers, whoever you know, computational scientists, mathematicians, jugglers, well, circus and, clowns. I don't know. <laughs> and we also both stay up quite late at night, so yeah, when we were working on the, the working on the piece together, yeah, there was text messaging at three a.m. Yeah, you know, I did a whole bunch of things. <laughs> It's like, oh, no, that, more, you know, more like a flat panel that's, that's folded. Oh, okay, so not these kind of things. And so you know, there even is this kind of, I don't know, even the moment of a collaboration, it's just an opportunity to get to know someone and learn from them. And that's been so far one of the beauties and why I enjoy continuing to work with you yeah. is uh, just to that's keep fair. learning from you. And, and when we work together, it's not predictable. You know, you had said, oh, we got, I got this pink tape. It's like, pink tape, all right. I and knew normally I'd be like, I'll know. go for a white, you know, black and white, you know. And I know, <laughs> and that's kind of why I did it, though, too, because I knew it would, I, like, kind of wanted it to be sort of, like, possibly uncomfortable for you. Like, not to be a jerk, you know, but just to sort of, like, push your aesthetic, um, like, feelings and beliefs and tastes. Uh -huh. And, and stuff like you know, totally. And I think it's it's fantastic. And actually, the reason usually I don't work with colors is I don't know how to. I don't know how to calibrate. I don't have a sensitivity to it. So I just all right. I will just not go there. And um, but I think it's you know Crazy. for me it's been an amazing you know conversation. And I can't wait for it to continue to go and continue to build a friendship. And yeah, me too. And I mean, I think like one of the one of the other big things that I'm learning about from you and from this experience is that. Um, Pretty much up until now, I have been working on projects that are that I pick and choose from, but they they are projects that are brought to me, and I feel in this moment now for the last few months, like finally, this I don't know maybe a bit of um, of bravery to actually think about a site that I'd want to put a piece of artwork in and. And I have the access to tools or access to people who would know how to machine things or make things. Because I genuinely only dream as large as I'm personally capable of making something. So if, if like the ladder is not tall enough, that's, that's as tall as the painting is going to be. And, and I, that goes straight across the board. So I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, what, what the, how we might, how, what I have no idea what we could do. I think that that thing we made should be, personally, I think that would be a really beautiful like stained glass piece, even though it define, defies the whole idea. But it already looked like it had a sort of like backlit color to it, you know? And, um, and actually, since we've had the conversation together, we've already started to test now how we can dye different, yeah. different <laughs> resins and, and start to figure out how to do something that's both translucent or opaque with color not in a designerly way, but more in a way to prepare a way for Maya to have another set of, of medium to work with with fiberglass in us. And uh, it's going to be exciting and fun. Yeah, I've already been pulling like pieces of canvas out in my studio to see how, what I can give you in terms of some tests and stuff. But uh, yeah, so this is like crazy cool. And I mean, and honestly, Brandon, when you emailed me, like I, I was like, a kind of confused, but so overjoyed, and um, I am—I was kind of amazed that I was on your radar, even. And I know that Lavender and Diego, um, you know, and you guys have all talked about. I'm—I'm I'm just so. I just think it's like it speaks to this institution to have someone like me come. I don't mean like someone like me. I just mean like someone that is uh, hopefully gonna take some risks herself and like open up new possibilities and um and I'm 
I have learned so much in the short, short time I've been here. And this has been, yeah, like super incredible. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, we'd love to kind of extend the yeah. dialogue and conversation with the audience and hear if you have any questions. Um, and it's to talk a little bit more about materials or kind of specifics of the material palettes that you work with. Um, so for Joseph, that includes um, particularly the formwork um, and the casting projects and any particular materials that were involved in that. And then for Maya, um, like the types of, I guess the types of paints that you work with, um, kind of the role of material in your projects. Yeah, so for me, um, Maybe I'll, I'll answer the question by going backwards to go forwards. <laughs> um, but uh, before I was doing really intense research into folding, um, I was more interested in mathematics and how to give. And I, and I became questioning, how does this start to have uh, material structural constraints beyond just pure geometry? Um, so then I started looking at things like the robotic stone carving industry and had a dialogue with Parra Stone Company in Wisconsin and was looking at how to and think, think through it through that kind of system and logic and material constraints, and also in dialogue with Arab. And then when I got to, I got invited to do a thing with a competition uh, called the Composites Challenge. And there, it wasn't so much that it was about what material I was using, it was more about how material was put on the table, and they said, oh, this is how we do it. And I was just looking at this like beautiful fiberglass cloth. I said, wow, it's such a beautiful textile. Why, why are we just cutting it up and putting it in a mold? And so that kind of made me start thinking about other materials like collars and how they get starched to be stiffer. Mm. And, that, and I started thinking about it as also paper as a fibrous material. And so that led me to kind of think through the material logic and constraints of fiberglass that was given to me and what would be possible. And then with the formwork, at that point when we got to that work, which was a collaboration with ETH in Zurich, um, folding was already really uh, I had a cer certain expertise already in it and understand certain mechanisms. However, the question or the framework of how do you make a strong formwork with partially through geometry um, started to make me think about, again, the curved creases and how they behave in a mechanical way as bistable structures. They, they pop into pace through controlled buckling. And the material there, it's just paper. I mean, there's nothing, it's not magic paper. And it's just wax coated on one side. It's no different than if you were to go to the grocery store and you buy some, you know, kind of a carton with uh, whatever that's folded up for your vegetables or something like that. So there's nothing magical about the material, but it's more so how the way in which you think through that material also became a, like a material logic. And, uh, and so I think uh, if I was thinking about folding paper just for folding paper, even at the large scale, that's different than thinking about folding paper to withstand the hydrostatic pressure of concrete. And so for me, there's kind of a beauty in folding and materials as being this kind of dance between physics and math and actual material constraints. Um, so I think that kind of answered, but it, the materials, there's nothing magic behind them. It's really about how you think through that constraint in relationship to geometry. Um, we have another question from the online audience. Uh, Maya, what was it like working for Facebook? Huh. And what constraints, expectations did they want from this commission? Um, it, it was an interesting project because we were initially, I was initially allow, allotted a three week window to work um, in an active construction site. And by the time, um, you know, the, like we were constantly dancing. I only had one assistant with me. And it was like this choreography of like dancing around the people who had to install the lights, but everything had, that had, couldn't happen before that happened, and that happened couldn't happen before that happened. And um, one of the like funniest things about starting the project was we, uh, you know, it was determined that we arrived on this certain date. We had already been there for a few days and were unable to get into the space. And in that period of time, they had built this huge glass wall, which made it impossible for them to bring in the boom for us to paint. And so they had, so we lost another day of them having to take down an entire wall that they had just built for us to, um, 
to you know to be able to complete the project. Um, it it was one of the most physically challenging uh, projects I've ever done. Um, I think there was a period of time for a few years in a row that um, a, a lot of things I was doing were really endurance tests, you know, and they were like in in the performative, uh, de, you know, like description of a perf just basically being close to the brink of breaking. Um, so uh, we, I had one assistant, we painted it in three days. That was two nights that we watched two sunrises. We would sort of like take kind of cat naps like on the roof or whatever and their espresso machines were working and they had all these uh, fridges that were filled with like Adwala and Red Bull and it, somehow we made it through. But. Um, but I did injure myself on that project because I was wearing a uh, harness that was meant for a 250-pound man. Um, I had to, of course, we had to wear helmets, and um, yeah, I uh, from that project we flew directly to Copenhagen and then from there straight to Berlin, back to Coney Island. Like I was, I was doing, I was working much too quickly. I was kind of. Uh, I was having a great time, but I was um, definitely hurting myself in the process, like sustaining a hernia and then still working, you know, and things like that, messing with my knee <laughs> or whatever. But um, yeah, I'm really, uh, I'm really proud of that piece. Um, and it was really interesting to work with Gary and his partners because it was so unlike the work of his that I was familiar with. And it was, um, it was so raw and it was, um, yeah, it's a really beautiful building. Like as far as a new model for a working environment, it was, you know, completely all open, recycling water systems, um, tons of natural light, uh, you know. Yeah, they, I'm saying all the positive things about Facebook and working for them. <laughs> <laughs> Those were all the positives. It was a great project. Great. Um, I have a next question. Uh, it's kind of also for both of you, um, and it's maybe to talk more about the relationship of geometry, uh, both to material or the constraints that you're working with. Um, I think you both talked a little bit about that, but maybe um, just more on the topic of geometry and what its role is in your designs? Um, I, I'll just say really quickly that like, uh, I really like to rely on my body being the, measure, the thing that measures out the space that I kind of showed you guys in the slides. And, um, and I like the patterns that emerge out of that. Um, and I try to shy away from rulers or tape or chalk lines or things like that. Um, but obviously like, I clearly love geometry in school and I clearly um, you know, have, have seen things that have clearly inspired what I do. But Joseph, you're really the one who, that, that's, that question's for you, man. It's like so, like, um, that's so you. Well, yeah, I mean, I would say um, probably one of my basic, busiest or main expertise is I would say just geometry. And especially working with math, I kind of became in love with uh, just pure shapes. And so instead of saying I'm going to go design something gestural, whatever it is, I, I love the idea of starting with something that's known and then transforming it to do something specific for me. It doesn't matter if it's a sphere or a torus or a cylinder or a donut. Um, and then same thing with folding. Like I always start I'm doing, there's a, I'm doing a lot of computational work with folding and fold finding how to uh, take an input geometry and figure out a crease pattern to create it. Mm. Um, but a lot of that also stems with this idea of starting with existing crease patterns and understanding how do you manipulate that system and framework to different kinds of boundary conditions. And so I don't know, that for me there's kind of this, part of it is maybe like a, a nod to history mm -hmm. and, this, and, also, and also taking something that's like defined in a dictionary and transforming it to something familiar but not the same. So kind of like an estrangement of something very familiar or known through a dictionary definition. And, um, yeah, and, then, and then there's the balance of like 
how does it perform for certain functions? Like a form of geometry is different than an arch or, or something that's meant to be uh, purely incompressive. So. Yeah, I, love, I, I hope I'm not cutting you off, but I love your reinvention of things. I love the fact that you make a distinction between origami and folding. And um, one thing I think I, I wanted to kind of add to that is that um, the geometry that I'm inspired by is made, is uh, like handcrafted embroidery, things that are made by women generally anonymously, things that are given as gifts, things that are... Um, that have a place in culture that um, is deemed more as being part of like decor and not actually seriously made as art. But all of that uh, language is so deeply coded and what I find incredibly fascinating is that it exists all over the world. Like when you look at old tribal uh, embroidery from Tibet, and Ukraine and um, Brazil, you know, like you find you find these patterns repeating over and over again, and there's something that uh, connects us all, I think, through that, which is much deeper than something that like we learn in a textbook about how to make a math equation, you know, and like, and I and I see that in what you're doing with the legacy that has come before you, and what you're taking and like pushing forward, you know? It's, it's, and it's also a little bit like the, you know, some of the game you might be having tomorrow. You talked about how you kind of start with something like a, an artwork you like, but then you trace it and you manipulate it and you work off of it. That was one of the games you talked about as like a drawing game. You know, it's, it's very similar to the way that I, I like to work with geometry is I feel like we don't start from nothing. Like mm -hmm. we don't design in a vacuum. You know, we look at the past as a way to project forward. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I think that's just just the way things are. We're just a little blip in time right now yeah. anyway. I mean, exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now we'll have closing remarks from Brandon. Thank you. Let's take a moment to uh, thank Maya and Joseph just one more time. This is a, an amazing event. <laughs> And Joseph, I, I think you were selling yourself a little bit short. I've seen you use more than just black and white. You have a masterful use of gray with the <laughs> ink uh, in morphing. I really appreciate that. Um, as our fall lecture series continues, please join us next Thursday as we welcome Tufts University professor Diana Martinez. Hosted in collaboration with the History Theory and Criticism Group, Professor Martinez will discover, or excuse me, will discuss America's early 20th century grant of independence to the Philippines through complicated architectural monuments that continue to exude colonialism, despite the so-called freedom of a self-determined state. As always, this lecture will be hosted both in person and online. Thank you all. Have a good night.